you want to begin with awesome uh wonderful so i'm calling to order the august 7th meeting of the african heritage reparation assembly this meeting is being recorded with the extension of chapter 20 of the act of 2021 this meeting will be conducted via remote means members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via zoom or by telephone no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means i almost am getting that by heart <laughs> Um, let's just make sure quickly that everybody can be heard. And I'll start with you, Dr. Rhodes. Are you I able to hear us, Dr. Rhodes? I can, hear, I can see everyone. I can hear everyone. And Michelle, sometimes you go in and out. Oh, no. Yes, you are. <laughs> well, that's not going to be fun. Um, is it happen, happening frequently or no? Okay. If it starts to happen at any frequency, I may have to move locations, unfortunately. So please let me know. Um, Dr. Shabazz, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. And Ms. Bridges? Yes, I can. Excellent. And Jennifer and Pamela, you are able to hear us as well. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. All right, so um, we do not have any attendees, but I'm going to call the first period of public comment um, because we'll have two as always. And so just calling this period of public comment, I'll read the statement briefly during the public. Actually, you know what? I won't read it. I will wait to the second period when there may be an attendee and I will read it then to be more efficient. Um, I have a hard stop at 1230 to take my daughter to a doctor's appointment. So, and thank you to everyone for your flexibility for meeting at a, a different time today. Um, so I wanted to begin by first uh, I'm providing an update on some um, providing an update on timing, as well as uh, some other pieces um, of the work that we've been doing here. Um, so let me first pull up. Okay. So for a variety of reasons, um, including additional time that I think we need to complete our deliberation on a variety of topics, as well as um, for some other uh, related matters, um, for Irv and I to have some a, a, a chance to speak more with uh, the finance department and the town manager, um, as well as um, for some other recommendations to have time to be worked out. I would like to move our uh, publication of our final report and our presentation into September. Um, Oh my goodness, do we have Alexis Reed? Woo! <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Hi Alexis. <laughs> oh, so good to see you. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing all right. I'd show you the baby, but we're a little, we're a little I see a hand. <laughs> You're a little uh tied up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I actually got to see pictures of the baby today um, at the coffee shop. <laughs> so, so excited to have you here, Alexis. Thank you. So, um, so I've spoken with the town council president, who also, by the way, was encouraging us to consider moving it into September um, just for a variety of reasons. Um, there are some major things coming through on the council, as well as I think this is a personal reason I'll share, um, that we will get more participation from the public in September than we will in August. Um, it's August tends to be slow. So the dates that we have are September 11th and September 18th. Those are both regular meetings of the town council. At this point, they're both open and we um, after we get through this iteration, um, my plan is for us. You're going in on and out. The report uh, later today and into tomorrow. Uh, okay, am I back? You're back now. Okay, maybe I need to stay 
somewhat close closer. Um, so Matia and I are planning to send this committee as well as Jennifer um, and Pamela and uh, town manager Bockelman and our town council president a draft report tomorrow as it stands. So this will be the draft based on all of the conversations that we have had as well as um, the conversation today. I am noticing that Matia is not here today um, and uh, though we'll be trans we'll transcribe the meeting. Um, so does anyone object to us uh, giving ourselves a little more time and moving our publication date from August 21st to uh, one of the dates a few days before the town council meeting in September? Without objection, no okay. objection. No I, objection. I, I, I question. I have no objection, but the all the information that you will be providing, you and Matia, to uh, the parties you just mentioned, would uh, would you ensure that we have all of that to each member of it? Yes, all right? absolutely. I mean, prior to you giving it out first, is that? Yeah. So I think what you're saying is that you would like to see it as members prior to the town manager and and Lynn uh, receiving a copy of it. Is am I hearing? Absolutely. You? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So we can definitely do that. Um, and just and keeping in mind, you know, I'll have actually this time it will be very clear on the document that it's a draft. Um, so we, you know, because one of the concerns is. And, you know, we can't really control what the media does. Um, so um, by sharing a draft of the report, we have to be clear that it is an iterative process that we're going through and that in order for us to make the necessary changes that we need to make, we do have to um, have it in a draft form, but that, um, that draft is... Uh, um, always open to being changed between now and its final approval approval by this committee. Okay, awesome. So any other objections, any other, anything else um, in terms of timing? Uh, do, and then once, um, Irv, I'm not sure if you saw Sean's email. He just sent an email like about a half an hour ago to the two of us. So once you've had a chance to take a look at that, we can figure out timing. Um, but I think it will be important for us um, to meet, continue to meet, but to determine which date of the two, September 11th or the 18th, um, is a better date for the committee once we have a little uh, more clarification from different folks. So what I was hoping we could do today is to continue our discussion on, there were a, a few things that I wanted to do. One is to continue our discussion on funding priorities. Um, the last two meetings we have discussed funding priorities and I'd like for us to continue that discussion um, as well as to um, begin to look at and discuss how we would like to uh, create a through line from the um, eligibility requirements that we've put forward to the rest of the report. So I think that's a discussion that we need to to have um, to so that the, that it doesn't look like it was just sort of placed in the report without context. We really need to have it um, be relevant to Amherst and to the recommendations that we're making. So last week we spoke about the funding priorities of youth programming and youth empowerment and Mattia transcribed the meeting. Um, and uh, so tomorrow when you receive the draft, you'll see the language that, um, that we have for the youth programming. Um, we also began to speak about affordable housing just at the end of our meeting. Um, and we, I gave a, a little update on the Ball Lane development or the formerly known as Ball Lane development in North Amherst. So I wanted to open that up. I'm going to share my screen really quickly um, just to, Jennifer, if you might be able to give me access to share the screen sharing. 
Let's see. Oh, Pamela's the host because she opened the meeting. Oh, so sure. Knows. And Dr. Rhodes, I see your hand is up. Is that from, is that? That's from earlier. Okay, great. Okay. Pamela, you're muted. All right, this looks like yeah. it's you should be a co-host now and should be able to support chair. Yeah. Okay, great. Yep. So I just wanted to again review these um these specific uh use of funds questions that we had in the survey. Um, not necessarily to value them, but to just again remember the categories. So we had buying or remodeling a house, renting a house. Uh, starting and improving a business, educational scholarships, symbolic acts, and cash payments. Um, so we have determined youth programming as a funding priority and began to talk about housing. Um, I'd like to continue that discussion as well as to discuss uh, whether we would like to include educational scholarships, um, business uh, grants, and um, symbolic acts and cash payments in, in, in any circumstances. So the floor is open now um, for, for those discussions. And depending on where folks are at, we can start with housing. But if any of these areas are an area that you would like to bring forward, um, and again, now taking a look at um, the, the respondent, the responses we received here, um, you can see that um, many of these, with renting a home, I think it was a little less popular, cash payments a little less popular. But for example, with cash payments, do we want to make a recommendation? Do we want to include cash payments as a funding priority in a particular instance? Um, like if you remember, Councillor Walker in our first listening session spoke about what it would be like if we had some sort of emergency fund that was available for folks who um, who fell on hard times or who needed some assistance to make it through. And so is that something that we want to revisit um, as part of our discussions? So I'm going to take this down and open the floor and welcome um, any members to speak on, on any of these funding priorities. Ms. Bridges, are you unmuting to speak? No, okay. I think that I've Stop. made it, uh, made it clear that I really um, want to focus in on up on on the youth, uh, especially through the recreation programs, after school programs, uh, etc. So it hits both recreation and education. Um, as far as um, individual cash payments, uh, you know, we, you, I think we all know we have a high hurdle uh, to jump over to do that. Yes, there are some individuals who I believe should have uh, some cash payments, but I, I, I don't think we're, you know, we need to uh, use a huge amount of time and effort going through that process. Now, you know, people want to go through that process, you know, and since this is going to be going, you know, the, after hope, hopefully the successive group will be along, around for a long time, perhaps they would want to pursue this through the legislative process. Uh, but uh, youth as related to recreation is really big for me. And youth as related to education is really big for me. Housing, is, uh, is 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 really really important, and I, and I think that uh, again, um, all three of these things for me uh, goes back to what I said before: is that we use our funds in conjunction with other funds, so that we use them in such a way that we're able to leverage our funds uh, 
to be able to come up with progr programmatic um, goals and objectives rather than us running and running on our own. We're able to have a more of an impact. We're able to uh, in, induce other people to join in with us, the town. Uh, and, you know, one of the refrain, refrains I've heard over and over again in the town is, hey, don't spend money and duplicate uh, services uh, that are already being presented. Add to them and make it additive. Absolutely. And I think that you outlined that in our last meeting um, really, really clearly, and, and that that has been included um, in the language that we're developing for sort of the overall philosophy, um, the the combination of what you and Dr. Shabazz contributed around that, I think, um, is really powerful as I've been as it's been developed. So um, that makes a lot of sense. Irv, can I just ask you a follow up um, on housing? Because I have personally heard you speak to this uh, a number of times and um, and that I know you are um, just generally advocating for home ownership as opposed to, or maybe in addition to rent, 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 you know, being able to, um, you know, rent. So I'm curious if you think the report should uh, focus specifically on ownership um, or is there some combination that you envision? Right, I, you know, one, just as background and just so I'm all, all transparent here is that, I have been working on an affordable housing program on, for a national basis for the last two years. Uh, it is now formed into where we have uh, a managerial team, an administrative team, a legal team, a mortgage banker, mortgage financing, and we're getting ready to launch nationally uh, in September on a fundraise, national fundraising platform. And, and the the whole idea is that uh, we're focused in upon home ownership on two levels. One for those who are below 80% of AMI and for those who are above 80% of AMI. And the reason for that is if we, when, when I look around and we look around the nation, there's a dis, the low income uh, housing in terms of incentives uh, and government government support, are are supported way more than the one the uh, for incentives for those above eighty percent AMI. And what we see happening is that having that dichotomy. By the way, 80, above eighty percent AMI, we're talking about workforce housing, workforce housing for teachers, fire people, police. Uh, hospitality workers, et cetera. You know, the, and, and, and the reason for that is that that is the middle class. That middle class is being, has been devastated. Uh, and the support for uh, funding of that is not there. And you just look around our town and you can see that. And that's, that is, can be generalized to the entire country. So what I look at when I talk about affordable housing is, is support for affordable housing for those below 80% and for those above 80%. And I'm talking about incentives that the town can provide. Uh, incentives, incentives to developers and incentives uh, uh, for home purchasers, purchasers, et cetera. What we are focused on is all across the board. And, and when I say all across the board, it's not only for new development, but it's also for buying up apartment buildings and turning them into home ownership opportunities via townhomes. Uh, and, and the reason for that is, is because across the country, large investors have purchased apartment buildings, raised the rents, and so that now what you have is that uh, we have a huge, large segment of our population, both low income and, and workforce housing uh, people who are rent burdened. I mean, they're spending more than 30% of their income on, on rent. Hmm. 
All right, and, and that is a tragedy across the country, a tragedy. And so we believe, my group, my team, uh, through uh, available financing means and financial technology that we can relieve that problem. I see here in Amherst uh, that the problem is so severe that, uh, uh, you know, both groups are priced out. You know, we, we in Amherst, we say we uh, want, there's a, a, a wealth gap. Well, it's obviously it's in their wealth gap because we have huge amounts of money being spent on uh, low income housing. And that's, that is, is desirable. On the, on the other hand, we're not doing uh, the other part for the middle class housing. So what we're, what we're creating in this town, which is mirrored nationwide, is a two class system. The very well, wealthy and the very poor. Anyway, I could go on, but anyway, there you go. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Rhodes. It's really insightful. And um, and so I think we can figure out how to take take that and, and put it into our recommendations. Um, one of the things that I keep thinking and coming back to is the amount that we will have each year, um, whether it's 50 or $100,000, um, we have to think about, you know, how we can stretch that money to impact not only the most amount of Black residents, but also to impact in meaningful ways. And so um, I was speaking with Jessica Ball Lane about, uh, you know, down payments um, and, and for that, for that uh, development, um, folks who are interested in purchasing um, homes there will be required to go through the same sort of process um, that anybody would. And that includes um, learning, you know, going through the coursework for being a first time home buyer um, and uh, having enough savings to use as a down payment. Um, and then also being able to um, sustain the cost of living, you know, utilities and, and everything else that's involved in um, purchasing a home. So um, that was really helpful to get to get that context from her. Um, Dr. Shabazz, you've been so patient. You're up. Okay. Um, I'm glad as we wind down our process to uh, find myself uh, once again in agreement with uh, Dr. Rhodes. Um, the, I just would like to build upon uh, his uh, emphasis on prioritizing uh, youth, uh, young people. Amherst, this town we're in is a college town. It's a uh, majority of its population throughout most of the year, as we know, is a youthful population is you know between uh, 16 and and 25, and uh, therefore it makes perfect sense for a reparative justice program to really highlight the needs of Black youth, uh, and in terms of the future of of where we are going as a people. I would say as well, it's not just a youth empowerment center. We really ought to broaden out our thinking in this in this area to include scholarships, to include problems with our high school. Uh, we met with high school students. We uh, uh, know about the problems. I, I feel unfortunate time got away. We never were really to engage with the school committee and with the school, of course, they were going through problems of their own in regards to LGBTQ and other kinds of equity issues. And so it just didn't work out as a good time to really try to engage with the school system about particularly the ways in which Black youth, uh, African-American youth, the children of freed people can, can be better supported in the school, but uh, we can certainly highlight uh, from our uh, uh, listening sessions and from our work, many, many points. You know, one of the things that was in the original reparations for Amherst uh, report about issues that came up in their uh, initial study and survey around the schools was the lack of the college going rate. 
the lack of graduate, you know, the, the disparity in graduation rates of African American youth to the, the general uh, students graduating from Amherst Regional High School, but also the college going rates. Uh, there was a serious disparity. How can reparative justice help to address that? We can't close the wealth gap. We don't raise enough money here in, in Amherst to be able to close the wealth gap for all of the families of our youth, of, of our black youth here. But we can do things to better support them in the school in terms of taking more uh, um, challenging college uh, coursework. I don't like to just say AP. It can be honors coursework. It can be coursework in a variety of ways uh, to support that. How can we better support our young people in terms of the counseling? I know when my child was there, the counseling services, uh, particularly in, in trying to prepare and promote Black youth to go to college was deplorable, was deplorable, okay? So how can we better support the, the efforts of the counseling staff there to, to know particular ways uh, from the research-based literature, from the various uh, expertise that's out there about how to promote the thinking of Black youth about going to college and, and the kinds of opportunities that are out there from the community college to the comprehensive uh, tier one universities like UMass. This is something we can do. This is something we must do. So these are, I, I'd like to really just build out when we say youth, we're not just talking about their access to recreational programs and, and helping to pay their fees if they want to be on the football team. You know, those are valid issues too. But I'm talking about the, some of the more serious things that have come up in our uh, uh, community that has been brought up in our community. Also, questions of, of helping to young people to know their rights to know their rights in interactions with the police, to better foster uh, their, their interactions with the community safety systems that we're trying to develop here with CRESS and with other kinds of ways that we're trying to develop here in Amherst so that our young people are not the victims of racial profiling and are not the victims of, uh, of, in, of, of interactions with law enforcement that seem disparate, even as happened this past year at UMass with a young person who veered off uh, uh, the, the, um, the instructions of the, uh, uh, on the roads, as we know about. So I just think there, there are ways in which we can try to better support um, uh, the, our, our youth in a very broad sense, in a very broad way, uh, then, then, uh, uh, and that this can be done uh, and must be done as part of our project. I will also, with the additional amount of time, I hope to um, have some thoughts for the committee to look at regarding uh, peoplehood. Uh, it's it's more than just symbolic acts. That's how we refer to it in the in the. Um, uh, uh, what do you call it in the survey, but it, it really has to do with how do we decolonize this town? How do we, you know, emancipate ourselves from mental slavery, even the, where the chains of slavery, shadow slavery were ended in the 1860s? We understand that the, the mental enslavement of everybody, not just black people, but of everybody to racism and to a racial uh, 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 a system of white supremacy is something we have not decolonized. We haven't broken uh, away from in this town sufficiently from our curriculum in our schools, uh, in, in our schools, as well as into the, the landscape, the built environment, the lack of any kinds of, uh, of, of streets and, and markers and whatnot that, that uh, indicate our presence and, uh, and, and note uh, our, our excellence in this town. So I, I will have time now to, to prepare a, a few comments on that that I think digest the work that we've done over the last two years that that hopefully we can tweak and we can uh, reach consensus on. That's all I'll say at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shabazz. Um, and I just want to come to Alexis. I did see Alexis, your hand came up and then went down. So I just want to check in with you before going to Dr. Rhodes. Um, yeah, it, really quickly. I, I wanted to first thank Dr. Shabazz for saying that because I, I completely agree. 
Um, and I guess I was just going to like sort of just piggyback off of that and like add um, mental health and conflict resolution as well. Um, it, but I don't, I, I, I think that he did a fine job of saying like, you know, reaching youth more generally. No, you make a good point. Thank you for adding that. What was that, Dr. Shabazz, in your response to Alexis? No, I just said yes, I, I agree. Thank you for adding that. The the July 5th incident, how we can prevent things like that from happening, conflict resolution, how we can uh, you know, support in terms of mental health issues. I, I completely agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis, for adding that and, and Dr. Shabazz. Um, Dr. Rhodes. I wanted to briefly come back to my comments before in terms of housing. Um, and I, and I'm, 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 I was particularly impacted by what you said about the ball lane and how they're going about doing that. One of the things that the company I'm associated with uh, wishes to do is to eliminate the barrier, information barriers. Uh, our company has a digital backbone uh, that includes all available financing for housing from public sources, federal sources, private sources, et cetera, all in one digital framework. And the reason for doing that is that there is a disconnect between people who are doing affordable housing and the information they have available. So when you said, you know, they're going to require down payment, well, there are programs around the country, including national ones that are both public and private, that provide down payment assistance. And without knowing that, you know, Ball Lane could go ahead and say, well, you got to have a down payment. And the person has, doesn't even have an idea that there is available assistance there. Uh, and, and I guess the point is that sometimes local, we at the local level feel that we're doing everything possible, but we are lacking in the overall, inf lacking in overall information that can impact what we do locally. And that does not need to be, especially when it comes to African Americans. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Dr. Rhodes. Um, yes, Alexis. Okay, I'm sorry. I just I I have to run, but I I'm so sorry to like come in and go. But I just wanted to say bye. Um, thank you, everyone, for all your hard work. Um, baby says hi. It's <laughs> beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Okay, okay take care. Thank you. Yeah. Right <laughs> <laughs> okay, see you. Bye. Bye. What did you say, Dr. Rhodes? I said that baby looks like it's not missing any meals. <laughs> I bet it's not. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. Um, so there's still four of us. Okay, good. Um, so wonderful. Thank you for adding that Dr. Rhodes. So just, um, I coming back then, I think we have a, quite a bit to contribute to the report around housing as well as the youth at this point. Um, and, and I, I got, um, the message, uh, Dr. Rhodes that, uh, about education and, and how that fits in to it as well. What do we want to say in terms of um, business development, um, business grants? Uh, do we want to make that a funding priority um, for the town, for the successor body? Um, and what do we want to include in, in that recommendation? Well, we look around Amherst in terms of the town of Amherst, the number of black owned businesses uh, is remarkably noticeable. Uh, and some of that has to do is with, with the ability to start businesses. To start a business, one needs knowledge, information, 
know-how and an entrepreneurial spirit. A spirit. Uh, and if you do not have those things in places, it's really, really difficult. This town, as far as I am concerned, uh, does not allow, does not have the entrepreneurial infrastructure for ordinary citizens to take advantage of. Uh, from entrepreneurship programs, through financing, through a legal framework, all of those things that are necessary. And, but, you know, so you, you have to start somewhere here in Amherst. And for me, again, there are two levels to it. I want to, again, I would like to offer entrepreneurial programs to the youth. There are a number of different models out there and I'm familiar with them and have taught, uh, taught those entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial programs for, uh, for kids three through high school, third grade through high school. Those are available and I consider those to be incredibly fundamental to establishing an entrepreneurial culture in this town, and that has to happen. And I, and that's something I, well, I'm working on now with certain people in town. Uh, and I, I would like to see that happen. I'd like to see it integrated again in the schools. I'd like to see it integrated with the programs we're talking about in terms of recreation, because that's part of their, their charge. And then on the, up again, the, the other level is for adults, the same kind of thing not only just the ability to start a business, but also having the infrastructure that would allow people to be able to start a business from the legal to the financial. We do not have that in this town and we need to have it in this town. And there are models for having, models for making that happen. So yes, that, that has to be for, for my, from my two cents, uh, we're in this society, it's a capitalistic society, it runs on, 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 on people's ability to earn money, but it also runs on people's ability to go out and find new ways of doing things and, and offering that back to the public. And that needs to be bedrock here in this, this town. We do not have it. It's especially, again, for African Americans, it's all for, for all levels, but for African Americans not to have thriving black businesses in this town, except for one, you know, here in South Amherst. Yes, I mean that's that's, that's an embarrassment. All right. Thanks, Dr. Rhodes. And I really appreciate um, the way that you've broken that down between the youth and just uh, developing that culture of entrepreneurial um, spirit and, and also knowledge. And then the adults um, being able to um, have access to the resources that are required to start up a business as well as um, sustain and thrive, as you said. So um, I think that's a really great starting point um, and certainly ties in the youth piece certainly ties in, as you said, with everything else we've been discussing around the youth. Um, so that's great. Um, would Dr. Shabazz or Ms. Bridges like to add anything right now um, or, or Pamela to um, the discussion on business? Okay. Not at this time. Okay. Um, so, um, so that was, there was the business and then there was, um, and we kind we sort of touched on it briefly, um, cash payments. Um, if we are to include any discussion in our report, regarding cash payments, uh, it will have to include the need for special legislation. Um, so we'll at least want to give the reader um, and, and the council um, the information that was provided to us by KP Law regarding what that legislative process would look like. Um, but I would like to know if the committee 
um, has clarity yet around whether um, recommending that we pursue or that the town pursue that special legislation and if there are particular instances uh, where we see cash pay payments uh, there the cash payments clearly are the least I think popular um, for variety for, for for many people that's not true um, for, for many people they're sort of um, seen as the most challenging, I guess, is a better way of saying it. Um, and we we know that the special legislation would be needed for for such a for such a um, a benefit to be made. So, any discussion on that at this time? And do any members have strong feelings one one way or another? Um, yes, Dr. Shabazz. Okay, so a um, couple of things. I think one is, as part of our municipal plan, um, it, it really is to give to the town and to the successor group that we hope is created um, something of a roadmap on which to build the infrastructure of a reparative justice program. And so I do think we ought to uh, in the appendix, provide the KP law review that we ought to also comment on on that uh, in terms of what our 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 research into what the, the next steps um, to pursuing that. Uh, what are some of the the challenges? What are some of the um, as well as some of the benefits for doing so? On the challenge side, as I recall. Uh, the, the, the discussion was around, uh, number one, the fact that the town already has a queue of home rule um, uh, uh, um, measures that it is pursuing. Uh, I understand ranked choice voting is one of them. I understand some other counselors have, have begun to throw up some other stuff for, for home rule uh, legislation. And when our piece was brought up, then it was like, okay, well, there's a queue. So I don't know fully where that really stands um, and where we may stand in terms of having this in the queue, but... Um, but that was one sort of challenge that, that came up. The other challenge that came up um, or consideration from my discussion uh, with a, one of our legislators at the state level is the idea that uh, uh, at the state level itself, the issue might be, well, why just grant this for, for Amherst if there are other uh, municipalities looking into doing the same thing, i.e. Boston, i.e. Northampton, i.e. wherever else. And therefore, rather than approach it on a one-by-one -one basis and, okay, let's do it for Amherst now, uh, the, the state may want to have a conversation about whether to create a kind of statewide um, uh, process similar to the Community Preservation Act, where any municipality wanting to do some type of direct cash benefit reparative justice work would already be covered by the state uh, level legislation. So, um, and, and, and to that I say, well, fine, but how can Amherst and how can our AHRA plan be a call to the state to initiate that statewide action um, in terms of some of the, the, the bills that are out there in terms of our own legislators perhaps proposing a bill to create a kind of statewide CPA type structure, reparative justice uh, um, uh, uh, act that could provide a statewide structure for any municipality wanting to do a direct cash benefit type uh, reparative justice action. So I do think we need to report on our findings, report on the, uh, the challenges, as well, well as the benefits. We do know there are instances where we have encountered issues that it might very well be that the town would want to support in some way with direct funds uh, issues of 
to, to repair specific injustices. I think of the Coleman family. Uh, I think of whatever is happening there in terms of the discussions with Amherst College. How might it help if the town also said we would put up so much funding for the uh, uh, for a home or for something to uh, be made right in terms of the Coleman family. Um, the uh, uh, likewise, um, we haven't discussed specifics of how um, uh, our, our first African American full time faculty member at uh, at UMass. Uh, who was so ill-treated in this town, whose reception in this, trying to find a home in this town, speaking of Dr. Edwin Driver, you know, we, we still have not directly considered what might be an appropriate way to, uh, on the part of this town, um, and, but one cannot rule out um, uh, uh, some type of cash benefit as a part of that um, uh, 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 process, even if it's uh, only in whatever it might be, you know, however uh, modest or 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 significant it it might be. So I I think there are benefits to having that option on the table for the reparative justice process, and I think there are clearly challenges with uh, how to move forward with respect to uh, state government giving us the the legal cover and the legal support to do this so that we could not we would not then um, be in jeopardy of uh, of counter uh, of, of the lawsuits um, for us to do this type of thing. So um, I or, or rather to be able to do it on a legal framework, given that there is a state law that does not allow uh, municipalities to make those kind of direct cash payments to any citizens for any reasons, uh, unless it's it, it's declared a public purpose. So those are my some of my thoughts and reactions to that issue. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. That was really helpful, and um, I think that um, our recommendation can be um, a discussion that outlines those benefits, the challenges. Um, and provide information that we've collected in our work um, and, and, and also to have a discussion in that recommendation around solutions. Um, one of the things I think a lot about is coalition building and how, um, you know, there's, there is usually a, a, a lodestar and Amherst in this case can be the lodestar for this particular matter to get it um, put into the wider discussion, um, and then we can recommend that the town build coalitions with other communities and community organizations who are interested in this. Um, I think uh, one of my goals for this report is that we are um, modeling a, 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 a process and, and a, a sort of a um, a roadmap, as you said, Dr. Shabazz, for repair, but also that we are normalizing this, that um, it's not shocking for one to, to think that having a reparative justice plan for um, a community's Black residents uh, isn't, it's not shocking. It's, it's, it's a sort of normalizing that this is um, a long overdue um, uh, and, and that we're simply providing this roadmap. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. It's 1224 and um, Jennifer asked that we approve minutes that are on the agenda before we uh, will have to call a second public comment meeting, uh, public comment period, um, excuse me. So I'm gonna um, just grab the agenda here to make sure I have, I'm going to move that we approve the meeting minutes from April 10th, 2023, April 24th, 2023, May 8th, 2023, and May 22nd, 2023. Is there a second? Second. Second. Excellent. Thank you. Any discussion on, um, on that? Dr. Shabazz seconded that motion. I'm going to go to a vote, Dr. Rhodes. Yes. Ms. Bridges. Yes. Dr. Shabazz. Yes. 
I am also an I, so those meeting minutes are approved and, um, and that's excellent. So I'm going to call our second period of public comment. And we do, uh, I think it's just Mattia who has called in. So um, I don't see anyone else in the attendees, um, but uh, there is a second period of public comment open. All right, so just to reiterate the plan here then, um, we'll get, because I, I I accidentally forgot to inform Mattia that we were meeting today at 11.30. As much as we are in communication, I thought I had communicated that. Um, so she missed half of the meeting. Um, so Pamela, if it's possible for you to send us the Zoom, send me the Zoom link so that she can have the meeting transcribed as soon as possible, that would be great. Um, so we'll work on getting um, to committee members and only to committee members and Pamela and Jennifer at this time. Um, this is going to be our first like substantive, I think, draft. Um, based on all of the discussions that we've had, all the various communications that um, that I and others have been having. Um, so, so it will be um, important for everybody to review it carefully and to be prepared the areas that we still have yet to discuss. Um, Pamela one You're going of our in recommendations and out. Um, we, that we lost uh, you for a minute. Oh. Okay, how how about now? You got me okay. back? Okay, or? you froze okay. for a little while. <laughs> okay. Did you hear where did I where did I where did I freeze, Ms. Bridges? What what was the last thing you heard? Pamela, you can, am you I frozen? Froze for me at um, getting uh, Mattia a, a transcript. That's where you froze for me. Okay, thank you. Okay, what I was saying is um, this draft that we're going to share with you is probably the first really substantive draft, um, and it will be important for us all to carefully review it. Um, before our next meeting so that we can at our next meeting um, have feedback. Did you hear me? You, you froze no. again. Well, you, the last thing that we heard, or at least the last thing that I heard was that it's important for the members of the assembly to carefully review the draft because this is the substantive draft before the next meeting and that's where you froze. Me too. Okay, perfect. Um, the last piece is just that I will indicate in the report, Mati and I will indicate in the report um, the area is that we still have to deliberate on in our next uh, meeting or so. So I would be prepared um, for our next meeting. If everybody can be prepared to stay for an hour and a half next week, beginning at two, I think that will get did, did that all come again. through okay yeah, all right so you, are there any oh what was that pamela so you froze again but the last thing that um you said was just uh um asking everybody to be prepared to stay for an hour and a half at the next meeting which will begin at two next week perfect okay any other other comments or questions before I adjourn the meeting? All right. Once again, a really wonderful um, discussion. Thank you very, very much. And we will see you next week. And I'm adjourning at 1229. Thank you, Michelle, for everything. Pamela, thank you. Okay. Bye. <laughs>